Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Test or to the New Testament book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation in chapter number two. The book of Revelation in chapter number two. We're in our series of the seven churches of Revelation. And each week we take one church and we kind of review it in the mornings. We take time to look at the text, that we read the text, explain the text, and apply the text. Just see what it says and make the application that's going to go for any church anywhere. On Sunday nights, we go back and study the church a little bit more historically because these were literal churches. These aren't allegorical. These aren't pictures of churches. These are literal churches that Jesus wrote a letter to. What do you mean? Well, Uh, um, (laughs) John the Apostle was on the island of Patmos. Jesus spoke to him and said, write these things down and write these letters. And so John dictated or wrote the dictation as Jesus said, write these things down. John would write the letter. Then he took this letter and he sent it to the very first church, the church of Ephesus. If you remember that each one of these seven churches go in almost a highway, they just go to the next stop on the highway. And that the church of Ephesus would take the letter that was given to them and they would copy this letter so they would have a copy to themselves. Then they would send the letter on to the very next church. And so this was a direct personal letter from the Lord Jesus Christ to hit on a historical church that each one of these churches had their own significance, their own problems, their own trials, their own persecutions, their own special things, unique features that each one of them had uniquely from each other. That's why studying them in their historical context is important because Jesus would make reference to things that were brought up to the things the city would know about and that they dealt with. We now come to the first letter, the church of Ephesus and the book of Revelation chapter number two. If you don't mind, once again, let's read this text, this personal letter written to an historical church, the church of Ephesus. Notice with me, Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 1. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, how thou canst not bear them that are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And with this, we're going to study the historical church, Ephesus, in its historical context. So that's what we're going to study tonight, Ephesus, in its historical context. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come to you, we're just asking that you would give us grace and mercy. Help us to have a good understanding of this text. Help us to see what is going on in this church and the events and the things that cover the city of Ephesus. And that we can make application to ourselves by studying this historical church 
apply it to our current local modern church. We love you, Lord. Help us to fall in love with you more. Give me your spirit to guide and direct. Let it be a help. Let it just build upon what we've already started this morning. And we can trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you don't mind, let's start off by taking a tour of Ephesus. Let's show you, first of all, the eminence of Ephesus. The eminence of Ephesus. Ephesus was a bustling city on the coast of the Aegean Sea. If you remember that all of this is dealing with the country of Turkey. And this is going to be on the border of the Aegean Sea, right on the coast in the land that we now call Turkey. Ephesus was a large and important city in Paul's day. And at this time, it was probably the fourth biggest city in the Roman Empire. So this is a big city. About this time that the letter is being written, or Paul's day, it contained 350,000 people. Now, that's a pretty big number. We know that today's standards, that's still a big city. But remember, in the ancient world, they did not have cities that went to millions. This was a huge city at the time. It's even more impressive seeing that the infant mortality rate, or basically uh, the uh, mortality rate of children from zero to five was 50%. That means if you were born, you had a 50% chance of living. That's just what it was in the ancient world. So to have a city in the midst of these conditions to be the fourth biggest city, to be 350,000 people, this is a pretty big, impressive city. The city was centrally located in the middle of Asia Minor, uh, bridging the gap between the two continents. Ephesus contained a crossroad of four major highways. That means four major roads came into the city. If you can imagine having a big city and having four interstates cross it, that'd be a big deal. It had a major artery going from the east to the west. Above all, the city of Ephesus was known for one major characteristic, and that would be the temple of Diana. Diana <coughs> uh, was also known as Artemis. <clears throat> it was a huge statue that according to legend was carved from a meteorite. So someone went and found this big meteorite that came from the sky and they said, what can we do with this? And so they decided from this meteorite to carve a statue of Diana. Now, Diana here is not a beautiful picture. We have a mixed audience, but it is an ugly picture of the mother goddess that Diana and Artemis were the goddesses of fertility. And if you could imagine what would go in an ancient world who doesn't believe in the Lord, what may be a pictured as forti uh, fertility inside of a mind of a man. In addition, the way that people worshipped Diana made it even worse. That here, if you could forgive, I'm going to try. They have, let's use a language, Cortesians, ladies of ill repute, that would worship and get people to come and worship by committing these acts in order to worship. So if people came and said, I'm going to go visit Diana and go worship at her temple, it was understood that they were going to hire one of these ladies and that they were going to go into a room and that they were going to worship in a specific act. All right, everybody who's adult? Okay, good. <laughs> now you say this is nasty. Absolutely it is. To make it worse, because of the clientele that you would have hanging around this place, it was a law stating that police could not rest a person within a several block radius of this temple. So guess who all hung out there? In the ancient world, it rivaled Corinth as the world's filthiest city. It is not a place where you want your kids to grow up. It's not a place where you want it to uh, have good moral values. It was a horrible place. 
And yet it was in this horrible place because it was a huge city that God led the Apostle Paul to start a church here. We could see him coming in Acts chapter 19 that the Apostle Paul comes and he begins to uh, (coughs) dispute, to discuss, to persuade the Jewish people every every, uh, Sabbath inside of the Jewish temple. And after a space of three months, they had people that believed Paul and they had people that did not believe Paul. When it found out that the diverse were hardened, the Bible says in Acts 19, that there was a bunch of people that said, we're not going to believe in your Jesus. We're tired of hearing about it. What Paul did is he took those who had accepted Christ as their savior and they went to the school of one Tyrannus. In fact, let's just turn there just because it's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. We're going to come back to Revelation, but look with me the historical setting in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. For those people who've been here for a while, you know that this is my ministry passage. This is a passage that God has used in my life and giving direction and seeing all the wonderful things that happen. So I love this passage. Acts chapter 19. Let's just see how this church inside of Ephesus was started. So we know Ephesus is the city and there's going to be a church that started inside of the city. Notice with me Acts 19 and verse number 8. Acts 19 and verse number 8. And he, Paul, went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. So for three months, Paul is asking questions and answering questions and opening the Bible and showing from the Bible and convincing and persuading and disputing and dealing with uh, objections and answering them all. Verse number nine, but when the diverse were hardened, meaning those didn't accept Christ, those that didn't like Paul's uh, teaching, now they're hardened and they believe not, but spake evil of that way. Remember that phrase, that way, is the way that Christianity was referred to in the ancient world. They didn't call them Christians, they said followers of that way. So when they spoke evil of that way, they are speaking evil of Jesus Christ. By the way, why is it called the way? John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man go to the Father but by me. What they're doing is that they're poking fun and acknowledging that they are followers of the way. Jesus said, he's the only way. They're followers of that way, that only way. So it says here in verse nine, but when the diverse were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he, Paul, departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So what Paul did is he went to a hall to a meeting hall and he rented it out the school of one Tyrannus notice what he does and continued by the space of two years so that all they that dwelt in Asia this is Asia Minor we now know as Turkey heard the word of the Lord Jesus both Jews and Greeks isn't that amazing so Paul here begins to train men and women in a Bible Institute setting and like a Bible college setting. He begins to train them about following the Lord. He begins to train them about what the Bible says. He begins to train them about starting churches. And you know what happened? Those people left Paul's Bible Institute and they went and spread the gospel so that everyone in Turkey heard. If you want to try to get a map in your head, can you imagine someone Uh, that a church gets started, trains men and women for the ministry, then everyone in Wisconsin hears the gospel in a space of two years. How did that happen? Was it because Paul went on a tour? No, Paul stayed put. But he trained men and women and they went out to tell the gospel. They went out. And it was an amazing thing that out of this filthy, nasty city, God put a clean, pure church that begins to work against the culture, works uh, despite of the objections, starts to work and train and move. Imagine this, people may come to go to the Lambeau Field, I mean Temple of Diana, and they think they're going to go get some entertainment, but instead someone gives them a track and they get saved and they start going to church and they enroll in the Bible Institute. Next thing you know, they're excited and on fire And they go off to go witness to their hometown. 
Well, enough people get saved in their hometown. They said, well, we need a church too. And a church gets started. It was from the teaching and teach, uh, preaching over at this Bible college, at this Bible institute, inside of the church, the local church of Ephesus, that several churches were started. Here were some of the churches that were started, meaning Paul didn't start them, but these churches were started out of the efforts of this Bible Institute. Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, Colossae, Heriopolis. Paul didn't start these churches. These churches were started because of the teaching and the preaching and training men and women for the ministry. And they went out to those cities and preached the gospel. Isn't that amazing? When we follow God's pattern, amazing things will happen. Now, I want you to pause and I want you to think. That Jesus said of this church of Ephesus, I know thy works. And I know thy labor. And I know thy patience. Does it take a lot of work to train men and women for the ministry? Yeah. You bet it does. Does it take a lot of work to disciple people? Yeah. Does it take a lot of work to go take the time and labor to go spread the gospel? Yeah. Not just here, but the whole region? <laughs> Absolutely. No wonder you can look at this church and see Jesus said, I know thy works, I know thy labor, and I know thy patience. He says, look at, from this church here, you've started all these other churches. From this church here, you've trained men and women to go into the ministry. You put in a lot of work. And by the way, that wasn't just past tense. They're continuing the work. In a city of 350,000, they have a church but in Acts chapter 20, it says that Paul called for the elders of Ephesus. That implies that there were several local churches started within that city. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? By the way, a church that big, there should be several local churches trying to reach their community. Could you imagine the soul winning efforts that were done outside of the temple of Diana? Well, church people shouldn't be there. Well... As we see in Acts 19, after two years, so many people were getting saved, nobody was going to the temple no more. One of the things that the temple did is that when people would show up and said, I went to uh, the temple of Diana, they would buy a little silver trinket. It looked like a football. Oh. And people would buy the little trophy and celebrate their great temple. I'm going to be a great fan to <laughs> Green Bay loves me. But, but <laughs> they would buy their merchandise. Well, when everyone's getting saved and as people are starting to go visit, I want to go visit uh, Temple of Diana and they're met with soul winners. And so instead of going into that little ring where the police can't go into, they're getting saved and not going in there. Instead, they go to church. Amen. Well, it's starting to affect merchandise sales. And now they have a big riot where two hours they're saying, bless the great Diana of Ephesus. Two hours they're shouting, great is Green Bay of Packers. <laughs> they're, they're I know I'm going to get in trouble one of these days. But we can illustrate that. Isn't Packers a big religion here? Yeah. So, you know, we're relating to this, carrying the idea that, could you imagine that nobody's showing up on Sundays because there's enough soul winners out there that people are getting saved and they'd rather go to church than show up to the game? Do you think that the people who are selling Packers merchandise would be a little bit upset if people stopped buying them because they're going to church instead? We're trying to relate to this idea here. This is a big deal. When you start messing with people's pocketbook, they get upset. They're not upset that people aren't worshiping Diana. They're upset because they've lost money. And so they throw in a big riot. They're going to try to kill Paul. They get Paul away. This is a big deal. By the way, doesn't it take a lot of work to have enough soul winners to go win all the people and who are going to sh not show up at Temple of Diana anymore to affect themselves? Jesus said of this church, I know thy works. I know thy labor. 
I know thy patience. He says, you work hard and you've worked hard and you're continuing to work hard and you're making a difference. It is noticeable. You're just not piddling around. The work you're doing is big. Again, have all these churches started from that church of Ephesus? That's a big deal. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of patience. That's a lot of prayer. In addition to their labor, this church was blessed with pastors. Think about some of the people that were the pastor of the church of Ephesus. You had Paul, the apostle. Could you imagine having Paul as your pastor? Even for two years, that would be a blessing, wouldn't it? I meant to have the apostle Paul teaching. And not only that, running a Bible institute. By the way, you know how much work it takes not only to prepare the messages during the week, but also to prepare Bible lessons and to teach all the time? For two years, he's teaching. Man, if you were really hungry, just sign up for a class and learn about it. Man, to have Paul as the two years, this is a big deal. By the way, Paul was at the church of Ephesus longer than anywhere else. He loved this church. He invested in it. After Paul, we have recorded Timothy, Paul's disciple, Paul's son of the faith as the pastor. When we see the writings of first and second Timothy, Timothy is pastoring Ephesus right now, the church of Ephesus. Well, if you can't have Paul, let's go second best. Timothy is a good runner up. He's been taught by Paul. He has the mind of Paul and he stayed for a while. That would be good. Who else pastored this church? You had John the Beloved. You know, the person who wrote the gospel record of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the book of Revelation. He was the pastor there for a while. Well, that's a great pastor too. This guy walked with Jesus. Not only could he ask questions about the Old Testament, what was it like about Jesus? He could tell you the story. He could recount the things. By the way, John was the most loving disciple. Even in his writings, you see love just come out of his writings under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That was a big key thing about the love. Well, if you got a pastor that talks about the love of God and loving all the time, isn't that a great pastor? Not a mean pastor. He was a loving pastor. Wow. Who else was the pastor? Well, you had, according to tradition, Onesimus. Onesimus, the runaway slave that we find in the book of Philemon, that he went from unprofitable to profitable. Paul led him to the Lord. He went back, got things right. And according to tradition, he was the pastor for a while. Man, someone who understood the grace of God. That's a good pastor. He understood grace. According to tradition, Dr. Luke was buried there. How would you like to have Dr. Luke as a church member for a while? I mean, he may not be the pastor, but he's probably teaching a Sunday school class. He's probably has a lot of stories about following the apostle Paul. This is a a doctor. He's someone who studied, someone who knew the history. I don't know about you, but I'd love to sit down at his feet and just say, teach me. This would be good stuff. I mean, this is a church that has things going for it. You want to know who else was a member of the church? Mary, the mother of Jesus. Remember when Jesus died on the cross, he looked at John and said, behold your mother, basically saying, go take care of my mother for me. When John moved up to Ephesus to pastor there, he brought Mary with him. What it would be like to go talk to Mary and ask him, what was it like when Jesus was a baby? I know everyone has that question. What was it like when he was a baby? What was it like when he was a toddler? What was it like when he was in school? What was it like when he had a job before he went to public ministry? Remember, Jesus didn't go to public ministry until he was 30 years old. He worked a job for many, many years. What was it like during that? Wouldn't you like to go ask those questions? Man, we don't have to wait to go to heaven. I just go to church. This is a church that has things going for it. No wonder Jesus said, I know thy works. I know thy labor. I know thy patience. This has a lot of things going for it. In fact, turn with me to the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 1. I want to show you something interesting. 
The book of Ephesians is written about five years after Paul left the church. So Paul has been gone for five years. He writes this letter to encourage them. But notice something he says about the church. The book of Ephesians chapter 1. The book of Ephesians chapter 1. And notice with me, if you don't mind, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. Wherefore I also, this is Paul, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. The apostle Paul says, hey, I've been hearing things about you. Uh Uh-oh, is it bad things? No, I've been hearing about your faith and I've been hearing about your love for the Lord. Well, for the Apostle Paul, five years after he started the church and left, do you think that's encouraging to hear? That the church is still going on? That the church has a reputation with other people about faith? The church has a reputation among other churches about their love for others? Well, that's a big deal. This is a church that is going well. They are, have great pastors, great teachers, great notable saints. These are church that other churches talk about and said, man, Ephesus, that's the type of church we ought to be like. This is a church that's working. This is a church that's laboring. This is a church that's soul winning. This is a church that's discipling. This is a church that's starting other churches. <clears throat> this is a church that is loving people. This is a church with full of faith. And turn back with me, if you don't mind, to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2, and notice in verse 2. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. And, notice the end, he's continuing with us. Guess what else he knows? How thou canst not bear them which are evil, and have not... have tried them that say they're apostles and are not and found them to be liars. This is a church that would not put up with false teaching. Now, of course, when you have Paul, Luke, John, Timothy, you're going to not allow a lot of false doctrine. These are people who knew their Bible. They're not going to allow false teachers. People come in and say, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. John the beloved would say, well, let's test this out. Let's check this out. Dr. Luke's there and say, I don't think you know your Bible, son. (laughs) They were put to the test. They were, and if they were not lined up to the Bible, they would say, nope, you're not teaching here. If you want to attend, just be quiet and sit down, but you're not teaching. They wouldn't let anyone teach a false doctor. In fact, vote notice with me, verse six, Jesus goes back and commends the church, verse six, but this Thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. Now, the end of verse 6 is pretty important. Who's speaking? Jesus. You know what Jesus just said? I hate them. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? That Jesus said, I hate them. What does he hate? The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. You're going to see this phrase pop up in a couple different churches. What is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? What is this teaching? Well, the Nicolaitans comes from two words. One word you might be familiar with. The first one, uh, Nico, which carries the word Nike. You you guys know what Nike is. The word Nike means victory. That's... Why we have a company in America that's made millions and millions and billions of dollars off the shoe. Victory. That's our slogan. Victory. Nike. Well, then you have the last part of it. Nike. Nicolaitans. The word laitin carries the idea of people. So you put it together. It's the doctrine of the victory over the people. What is this doctrine? It's a type of doctrine that takes away people's liberty and says, you just do what I tell you to do. We will tell you what to believe. We will tell you how to act. We will tell you what rituals. We'll tell you if you're going to get saved or not. We don't want you to read your Bible. We'll tell you what it says. By the way, this doctrine will pop up in the other churches and in church history. But here, Jesus is commending him that you hate this doctrine. You hate a doctrine that takes away people's faith and their choice. They should choose to serve me. 
They should choose to love me. They should choose to believe in me. Now, you're not going to tolerate false doctrine, but at the same time, you're also not going to force your faith on them. You're going to say, this is what it is. You choose to believe or not. Does that make sense? Yeah. Those are both necessary. So this is a church that has done well. This is a church here that is good works, has good pastors. They had everything going for them. And yet, Jesus has a problem with them. And yet, Jesus has an aunt. We start off with the eminence of Ephesus, how important this church was. But the second thing, there's a decline of devotion. A decline of devotion. Notice with me in verse 4. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Why? Because thou hast left thy first love. As we reminded ourselves this morning that a genuine love for the Lord is what's necessary for us to truly worship him in our service, in our devotion, in our labor, in what we do. Despite the outward activities and the commendable efforts of this church, they had lost their first love for the Lord. They're now on autopilot. I meant after having so many pastors, so many good teachings, so many, there was, this is what our church does. We go soul winning. This is what our church does. We go discipleship. This is what our church does. We have church service. This is what we have. We have good preaching. What does our church do? We do this and we do this. They have a lot of activity, but they lost the heart behind the activity. They lost this passionate, heartfelt love and worship. And it's now being replaced with routine and obligation. Why are you teaching the class? It's my turn. Why are you watching the nursery? Well, it's my turn on the schedule. Why are you cleaning the church? Ah, because they're making me. It got to the place where they're not doing it for the Lord. It's activity. It needs to be done. It's what we've been doing. But they're not doing it for the Lord. They're doing it out of habit. They're doing it out of duty. They're doing it out of this is what we're supposed to do. The loss for the Lord becomes a critical weakness. It starts off subtly. It starts off slowly. So people don't even notice it. It's not like you one day you say, well, you know what? I hate the Lord. I'm going to go to church. Most people don't even recognize when it leaves. We just been doing what we're supposed to, but it gets gradually gone as we become increasingly more focused on our duties, our obligations, and less with our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. As we had said this morning, the very first step away from this is not being thankful. That's how simple it is, is not being thankful. We're not thankful for what God has done for us. We're not thankful for the opportunity to serve. I'm serving just because I have to. When's the last time you thanked God for the privilege of cleaning toilets? I didn't get any amens there. When's the last time, praise the Lord, I get to vacuum the carpet. Praise the Lord, I have an opportunity to be at church. Praise the Lord, I have a great thing to make sure the coffee pot is cleared out. It starts off with not being thankful. We take things for granted. Praise the Lord, I have a great opportunity to pull weeds from the garden. You see, that's where it starts off. You say, why are you pulling weeds from the garden then? Because it needs to be done. You see, what happens is that we've lost doing it for the Lord. We're doing it just because it needs to be done. And we can work hard. There could be the greatest weed pullers ever known, but not doing it for the Lord. Things get old. Things get routine. Things just go and we're not doing it. We don't even think about the Lord when we're doing the things anymore. We could show up to soul winning. Well, our church goes soul winning every Saturday. I'm just going to show up instead of saying, Lord, I get a privilege of serving you today. What a great opportunity. I get to pass out a track. This is wonderful. 
Lord, I really pray that because you've done something in me, I really hope you do something in someone's life because of this track. We lose our thankfulness. And then it just goes downhill from there. We start to lose our fervent prayer as we talked about this morning. Then we get to the place where we're talking to God, but it's rather talking at God rather than talking with God. We give God a laundry list. We said, oh Lord, thank you for this offering. Please bless it. Amen. We don't even talk to God. It just, it's our ritual now to pray. We say some magic words and everybody says amen. And then they put stuff. We start to get to the place where our things are routine. Say, prove it. Absolutely. Anytime that there's a meal and someone has to pray. They're not talking to the Lord. They're saying some words so they can get to the food. Amen. All right? We're not the only sinners. Right. Does that happen in your house? Or do you have someone who actually takes the time? You know, don't answer. But see where we're lading. We get to the place where we say some magic words. Or going to bed. All right. Well, Lord, I got to better say some sort of prayer so I could wake up in the morning. Lord, I'll make sure I'm awake. Thank you. We're not talking to the Lord anymore. We just say some words because of routine, because of ritual, because that's what we're supposed to do. Our heart's not in it. We're not looking at the Lord. It's all gone. Eventually, it gets to the place where our Bible reading is dry and crusty. Well, I read my Bible today. What'd you read? I don't know. Have you ever read your Bible and you have no clue what you read? It was some words. My wife laughs at me and says, because you know your Bible, you could cheat even if you didn't read your Bible. You know what stories are in there and you can just make it up. Some of us can do that. I know what story is in there so I, you know, I could teach a lesson just off of memory. But what you read? We can get to the place where our Bible reading is dry and dusty. Why should we read our Bible in the first place? To be with Jesus. To learn more about Him. But our Bible reading can be cold and dry. It could be just academic. There's no heart into it. There's no fervor. There's no excitement. There's no life. All of those are symptoms of the problem that we've lost our first love. We're doing the right things. Well, pastor, I read my Bible. Why are you yelling at me? Because it's not about your Bible reading. It's about him. Well, preacher, I say prayers. Yeah, but are you talking to anybody? But preacher, I'm doing all these things. What more do you want from me? I had someone do that once. What more do you want me to do? I do this and do this and do this. How's your love for the Lord? (gasps) It may have been something you looked in the mirror, had that same conversation. You see, activity is a poor substitute for spirituality. Activity is a poor substitute for spirituality. Where is our heart for the Lord? We need to go back and see the love that our Savior has for us and then respond to that love. Lord, you've done so much for us. This devotion can start moving away. Which now brings us to one last thing. The peril of apathy. The peril of apathy. What happens if we continue in the state? I meant here is a church that's doing all the activities right. Why would Jesus bother with them? I mean, just let him keep working. Just let him keep serving. Why bother this? Because it matters to Jesus. Notice again in verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Here we have what Jesus says to remember. We need to remember that we were saved. We deserve to go to hell. And that we need to respond to him. Notice what he says, and repent. Remember the word repent means a change of belief that leads to a change of behavior. What's the change of belief? The change of belief is that I need to fall in love with the Lord. What's my change of behavior? The rest of my behavior following that. Going back to him. I need to repent and go back to the place where I'm in love with the Lord. Now, some people have taken so many steps away, it's going to take a lot of steps to get back. But you need to start making that path back. 
We know that it, we're not saying flip a switch, but we are saying, come change your mind. I am so far away from the Lord in my heart. I'm going to start walking back and it's not going to be instant, but I'm going to strive for that. And I want to get back. That's why this is not an instant thing. This is why a church has a hard time. That's why individuals have such a hard time because it's not an instant fix. You develop all this time to get away from the Lord. It's going to take some time to get back to him. That fervent heat it, but you have to on purpose march that direction. Notice as it goes on. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else. Now that or else, you don't see a lot of those in the Bible. This is a threat or perhaps it's a warning or else. You know, it was one thing for your parents to say, you better do this or else. And then kind of dot, dot, dot. And you fill in the idea. It's a different thing for Jesus to say, do this or else. I know there's a lot of people who have in mind that Jesus is always loving and a wimp and a pushover. This is not pushover talk. Fix your heart now or else. That's a big deal. Or else what? Well, let's see what or else what. Verse five. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come to thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Jesus said, fix your heart, not your works, fix your heart. Or else I'm going to pull your candlestick. Remember the idea of the candlestick is their church. I'm going to pull it. I'm going to pull it out of its place. Your church is no longer going to exist. Well, let's look in history. Did Ephesus, did they repent? Did they get things fixed? Did they go? They did not. For 1,700 years, there was not a single church in Ephesus. 1,700 years. That's a long time. The Lord Jesus pulled his candlestick. You said, well, but, but, but that's not right. Listen, it's Jesus' church. He could do with whatever he wants with what is his. He said, this is my church and I could demand that the people worship me. Your work's great, wonderful. You're doing good, but I'm looking for your heart. I want you to continue your works, but I want it to be done with a heart of worship, a heart of devotion, a heart of love. I want you to come back and do it because of me. I want to be your reason. Remember, it all begins with God. It all ends with God. God is the goal. He wants it to be. So when you go out and say, why are you pulling the weeds? Because God wants me to do this. Why are you washing toilets? Because God gave me the privilege and he died for me. The least I could do is scrub this clean. The least I can do is serve. The least I could do is pay attention in church. The least I could do is sing songs thinking about him when I'm saying words. The least I could do is make it all about him. Because all that he's done for me. Here's a church that had the right teaching. Without a doubt they had the right teaching. But that was not enough. Here was a church that had the right stand on issues and standards. But that doesn't mean that God was with them. God wants a church that seeks after him first. It's all about God. Let's illustrate this. How can we illustrate this type of love? How do we illustrate this ridiculousness that we have? Because even preaching like this, we could still keep in our mind that, you know, partial, little bit, maybe just some here. But let's think about it this way. Let's imagine that we have a wedding. Praise the Lord, we have a wedding. We have the groom come up. Then we have the bride come up. The bride is being escorted, given away, and now they come. The preacher preaches a message and then says, all right, let's see, will you keep your vows? Let's make your vows. And he goes to the groom, do you? And he says, I do with great enthusiasm and everybody rejoices. Then he goes to the bride and says, do you? And she goes, well, I'm not quite sure. 
She goes, let's negotiate this. How about I give you one day a week? Maybe two. Maybe, you know, Wednesday nights. But I'll give you one day, maybe two. However, I need time for myself. So on Tuesdays, that's reserved for me and you can't ask any questions and I'm allowed to hang out with any guy friend that I want and do whatever I want, no questions asked. Would that be acceptable? No, no of course not. Isn't that ridiculous? Remember that the church is the bride of Christ. Now, what we're expecting from the bride is to say, I do, and I'm devoted to you completely for the rest of my life. I am yours. That's the correct answer. That's what we're looking for. We're not looking for, well, you know, I don't really want to be too serious about this thing. I kind of want to do my own thing. Is that all right? No. That's the kind of commitment that the Lord expects from us. He died for us. He paid the price for us. He wants to hear that Jesus, if you want something for me on a Thursday afternoon, it's no problem. Amen. Jesus, if you want me to do some extra work on a Friday afternoon, no problem. Because I love you, it's no big deal. If you want to spend time with me on Monday night, that's acceptable. That is the type of relationship that Jesus wants from his local church, from the people who make up that local church. He is looking for people who say, Jesus, I love you. And because I love you, I'm willing to spend time with you and serve you. This is what Jesus is telling this church that says, listen, you better get your vows right. You better get that heart right, or I'm going to pull your candlestick. That is not unreasonable for a groom to ask of his bride. And it is not unreasonable for the groom to say, you better get this fixed. We've been married for a while and you still don't have a heart for me. You got to get this fixed or there's going to be problems. Isn't that understandable looking into that light? We are the unreasonable ones, not Jesus. It is perfectly reasonable for Jesus to say, I have something against thee because thou hast lost your first love. You're no longer in love with your groom anymore. You're no longer in love with the one that you committed and was married to. You're no longer in love with the one who died for you so you wouldn't have to. He says, your works are great, but your heart is not. Return unto me. Repent. Or else... Jesus is reasonable. Our response should be, as we look at him, to repent and say, I'm coming back to you. I want to go back and say, I love you. And you look down from heaven and say, I know you do. That's the type of response we should desire. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.